Jonathan Lenin was talking about that what makes organic compounds and, and uh, how do you go from organic compounds to selection of the few organic compounds out of the millions possible. You know, the, the, I'll give you an example. There is a, an organism that fixes carbon dioxide, makes everything it needs from carbon dioxide. The total number of organic compounds in that cell is 140. Okay, that's 140 to make a living organism. There are well over a million organic compounds that are made. So how do you select that 140 from uh, millions of organic compounds? That will be a, a, a pretty interesting issue, but that's the top-down approach. And the bottom-up approach is where we really get most of the theory about what early life looks like, and that's from extant life. And so the original life community basically, I will confess, is divided into two groups. The replicator first group. I want something that divides right away. And this is the RNA world group. And then there's a the metabolism first. Say, there's no way you can make RNA unless you have some kind of way to, to build energy and to make the organic compounds. In a sense, I don't belong on either one of those camps. I belong on a camp that brings everything together, whatever that kind of camp is. Uh, and then this, this last lecture, which is the Lost City hydrothermal vent environment, is a relatively recent uh, volcanic environment that has become a model from, for several people as, as a model for maybe the, the environment for the first group of organisms, the first microbial community. And I'll talk a little bit about that because it happens to be my research also. So I have a lot of cool pictures and things. And, uh, as, as I'm very actually very enthusiastic about that environment. Uh, and again, we didn't know anything about it. Uh, it was discovered serendipitously 10 years ago on a random dive, and they found this new hydrothermal vent system, and we really didn't get samples until 2005. And so most of our work has been in the last few years in that environment. And then the origin of complex organisms. Uh, and Jonathan talked a little bit about that and the, pos and the improbability, maybe, of, of making that on other planets. I'm much, much more optimistic, and primarily it's because I'm so Darwinian in my thinking. Uh, and I'll explain why being a Darwinian thinker uh, makes the uh, evolution of something like a eukaryote almost inevitable. And because of what we know about its origin, without microorganisms, eukaryotes would not form. And so all the current theories about the origin of eukaryotes involve microorganisms. And so what I want to do is, is really build on that picture a little bit, because that is also very, very cool. Uh, it gets me to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is symbiosis, and how uh, microorganisms and animals actually interact. And it turns out that my field of hydrothermal vents has some of the coolest symbiotic associations that there are, and so I'm, I'm going to share some of that with you. Uh, I also want to point out that I actually work on viruses, and my PhD thesis was on viruses. Um, and now there's a, 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 a real interest in the origin of life community on not only the origin of viruses, but what early viral type systems, whatever they may have been, have actually been, what their implications might actually be in terms of the origin of life. And some very interesting theories have come out of this, including that perhaps viruses were the first DNA entity, and that viruses actually had transmitted uh, the genes to go from RNA to DNA. Uh, uh, and, and there's some examples of that that I'll... I, hopefully talk about, and then we'll see what else happens. Again, I work on hydrothermal vents, and this is one of the most dramatic uh, deep sea volcanoes. This is about 540, and it just happens that it actually exploded during the time that this uh, environment was being looked at. This is from the Ring of Fire, which is the volcanic arc around uh, Pacific Islands, and this is spewing out elemental sulfur 
and rocks and everything in real time. So we were just very, very lucky. You can see the yellow elemental sulfur puffing out of this. So these are kind of the cool environments. And what, they're not that cool actually, and they're, they're pretty warm. Uh, and this is very low pH, and it's actually about 240 degrees Celsius. Uh, the fluid is coming out of this. And you can see it's a pretty serious eruption. Hmm? The scale, the scale, scale of uh, the scale of this is probably across this whole uh, picture here is somewhere about maybe uh, eight meters or so. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to show you more of these, and and part of what I'm going to be talking about is is how these deep sea volcanoes could actually contribute something to the to the origin and early early stages of life, and why. So the first order of business is, can we define life? And is it important in our search for life? I mean, do any of you have any opinions on that? Do you think we need to understand how to define life before we can look for it? You think we, how many people think we, we need to do that? It's like religion. <laughs> so I'll see if I, I agree with that or disagree with that. We'll see how that, that goes. So if life as we know it is the only form of life possible and or the best of all possible designs of life, is, is, that, is that true? And there are uh, uh, individuals in the community that really do think that life as we know it, carbon-based life, for example, that does what carbon-based life does is the only possible life. Uh, and there's others that have really broadened that area. And then what are the limits of Earth life? and can it evolve to grow outside the limit of Earth environments? So, so Jonathan talked about Titan, and I, I really think Titan is incredibly interesting. It's just not a lot of water there. So can a carbon-based life form actually adapt to conditions on a Titan grow in an organic solvent, for example? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this because we now have the tools to actually design organisms and design genes. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work being done in that direction and how that could be applied to really broadening our understanding of the limits of organic life and how it could, uh, whether or not we can actually determine it, uh, whether it can grow outside of the limits of, of Earth. And do the characteristics and requirements of Earth life tell us about potentially habitable planetary bodies? It certainly does absolutely does. I, I think that as I discuss the characteristics of Earth life, if we're going to look for Earth life, there are certain characteristics of Earth that are absolutely necessary to get life as we know it. And so in the search for exosolar planets, I'm going to make the point later on that we are really want to look for a tectonically active planet with water. And if we want to find life as we know it, we're going to need a tectonically active planet with water. And I'll make that argument and, and, and talk further about that. And of course, later on, the origin and early evolution of life. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is really based on this top-down approach, what we can learn from extant organisms. So that includes the possible environmental settings, the origin of life, ancient metabolisms and their origin, the origin of the replicator, the RNA world, the last common universal ancestor. And I'll talk about that. How many of you are familiar with the last universal common ancestor? What do you think about that? What did this? It doesn't feel hmm? It doesn't feel right? Well, it, it's really interesting, and I'll, I'll mention this. We have a concept in biology called the unity of biochemistry. How many of you ever heard of that? Okay, a couple of you. The unity of biochemistry actually goes back to the early 1900s, even before we knew about uh, nucleic acids or DNA being a genetic material. Uh, it came from the fact that uh, all organisms use a common energy source. They use the same 20 plus amino acids. And now we know they use the same genetic code. Uh, essentially, uh, we are all alike on a molecular basis. And that's the unity of biochemistry. And the unity of biochemistry is what really 
uh, is the major proof for that there being some uh, last common universal ancestor. I don't like the, the, the last common universal ancestor concept. I like the last common ancestral pool of genes. And, and so selection is what really was, was really important. You've probably had this wide panoply of different genes, possibly even different codes, but the selection of the best one won out and then it radiated out into a bunch of different organisms. And we'll talk about that in, in greater detail. And then the origin of eukaryotes. The bottom-up approach is what we can learn from organic chemistry, earth history, geology, and geochemistry. So Jonathan again talked about uh, interplanetary dust particles and others that make organic compounds. There's a lot of ways to make organic compounds. And I will, my bias is that carbon organic compounds are just made in so many ways that they're present throughout the universe. That uh, any life probably that, is, is, that, that we know of is going to be probably carbon based. It's just too easy to make. So, what I hope to cover uh, the next 30 something minutes is trying to come up with a definition of life and that when we think our canonical characteristics of Earth life and, and whether or not those are important in search for life elsewhere. And then if I have a chance, I'd like to get into some of the uh, diversity in the three domains of life. So, I, can we define life and is this an important issue? There are, there's lots of definitions. In fact, there's a whole book that has over a thousand definitions of life in it that's been published. Uh, most of them are Darwinist, and I'll explain what that is later. Uh, but there's also a sizable group that I call metabolists. And then they're energists, which goes back to Schrodinger's uh, early work. And then there's the biospherists, which are not a lot of people, but uh, Bob Shapiro and, and Feinberg wrote a really interesting book. Uh, Shapiro is a biochemist, Feinberg is a physicist, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The complexus is really just putting everything together. But they all come up with, as I say, there's more than a thousand definitions of life. And the evolutionist the, the definition of life, again, Evolution being descent with modification, so that that modification is mutation and natural selection. Uh, and so it's, <clears throat> we can talk more about evolution if you like. But these are just a set of definitions, and I've listed just the ones of people who are really very active in the field. These are top-rate people, they're National Academy members, they're, you know, they're really but life is a self-sustained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution, for example. Self-replicating, evolving system, organic chemistry. System capable of evolution, natural selection, blah, blah, blah. So this is, this is, it is a wide variety, but they have this sort of Darwinian evolution component to them. The metabolist definition generally they want a series of chem chemical reactions that produce energy and increasing complexity of organic compounds. And that replication and evolution are not part of this early definition. And the idea uh, in, in the metabolist view is that unless you actually have this sort of ongoing set of reactions that not only produce organic compounds but energy, you cannot not actually reach the complexity of, 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 of life as we know it. This idea, although not uh, used as much as a definition, has become much more important as a model for the origin of life. Uh, that essentially you cannot have life without this sort of metabolism. And for those of you who are not familiar with metabolism, it's the sum of all chemical reactions in living organisms. And it's divided into two main categories. Uh, catabolism, which is where you actually release energy through breakdown of complex organic compounds, or in fact, in some cases, uh, 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 small organic compounds. Anabolism is where you actually build complex organic compounds. So you take simple organic compounds and you make proteins, you make nucleic acids, you make the membrane lipids, that's an al an al that just as part of the definition. Now Feinberg, Shapiro and Feinberg, it's a wonderful book to read. 
It, it's the most imaginative book I have ever <laughs> read on the defining life. I don't know if you've ever read. It's, it's incredible. Well, anyway, their point is that life is fundamentally the activity of a biosphere, and they try to define that. A biosphere is a highly ordered system of matter and energy characterized by complex cycles that maintain or gradually increase the order of the th system through an increase, uh, in, through an exchange of energy with the environment. A little bit of kind of what Jonathan was talking about. When, uh, the definition would include as life, plasma life, for example, in the interiors of stars, including white dwarfs, which you can see down in the sort of really cool image of a, well, right there. Mm -hmm. of a, so he, he, his definition really broadens this to go way, way outside of, of what we normally think of as his life. And I won't go further into it, but it's a really a cool book to read just for its imagination. Now, there's a couple of papers. Chris Chiba was involved with that with a philosopher, uh, Carol Cleland, uh, in a couple of papers, the first one in 2002 and then again in 2007. Cleland discusses the idea of definitions and, and the philosophical dilemmas on the nature of definitions. And so definitions specify meaning by dissecting concepts that, we're, that, that we already possess. So she has two kinds of definitions. Words or terms whose existence depends solely upon human interests or concerns, and you can see those. The natural kind terms such as life, water, and heat cannot be described or defined by describing properties because there's more to their meaning. So for example, she gives the example of water being cool, tasteless, odorless, flowing, etc. That's not a definition, that's a set of characteristics. The definition of water came when we could define it as hydrogen H2O. And so her point is, is that we do not have an H2O equivalent for life. Uh, so defining life from properties of life is problems because there are non-living analogs. For example, replication, we can see clays uh, replicating and other minerals replicate. Uh, ability to evolve, mineral growth involves changes and, and some of those have been considered mutation. There's a whole book written by Karen Smith, a British geologist, uh, that basically makes the point that first life were clays. And because clays can bind organic compounds, with, after you've made a lot of complex crystal structures of clays, then they bound organic compounds uh, where uh, polymerization occurred and you made a wide range of complex organic compounds. But the template that actually had the diversity on it was clays. So that's a Karen Smith thing. He's, he's still writing today, uh, you know, uh, moving on this. Things that replicate energy and fire, etc. So none of those are, are exclusively for life. <clears throat> so what we don't know is, is, that, is exactly how all of the components that make up a living entity become life. This is kind of the Gestaltian way of approaching things, where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, that we can basically reduce a living organism to all its components but we don't know how putting all those components together results in life. So Cleland and Chiba in their 2007 approached this dilemma by pointing out that really to answer the question what is life we require not a definition but a general theory of the nature of living systems. This theory does not yet exist. So there, there's the dilemma. <sighs> anyway, moreover, a definition of life would have to include any living entity, even if it were radically different from Earth life. Uh, and we don't even, within our own imagination, other than the Shapiro-Feinberg work, we don't know how to think about something living that goes beyond what we actually know on Earth. Look, do you want me to talk about Craig Hoyle and Wick Ramasing? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I want to do that right now. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting, yeah. I mean, because how many of you have ever read Life Cloud by Hoyle and Wick Ramasing? Good. Yeah. Anyway, that, it's, the idea is that even, uh, the early idea is that even that all microorganisms on Earth actually uh, 
evolved, uh, came about in, in comets, and then that rained on Earth. It's the interesting thing about it that even human pathogens, they claim, would have come from these cometary clouds. I'm not going to dwell on that, but that's another idea, you know, that, uh, that I don't think is, is really very, very difficult for me to defend. Uh, but that is, that is out there. There's a lot of interesting ideas. So the, the definition of life, again, would have to include uh, living entities, even if they're radically indifferent. So this implies that a definition is not a list of just characteristics possessed by Earth life. It may be something more complex than that. However, I want to make the case that the ability to replicate and undergo Darwinian evolution, I think, are essential characteristics of all life, even if significantly different from Earth life. They are not a part of a definition, but instead essential mechanisms to produce progeny and to create diversity and complexity. And I think you have to have something, you, replication and something like evolution as we know it are necessary if you want to create diversity and have something that produces progeny. So these are characteristics that are, I think are important. But what about and you know we can look at some other interesting things, a chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution definition. Definition holds for what is possible versus what is conceivable. So if we were to encounter some of the uh, Star Trek <laughs> individuals, uh, and as I say, not a conceptual Star Trek, we would be forced to change our defini definition, include them as a living system. Uh, we don't change because uh, obviously <coughs> We don't believe that weirder life conceived in Star Trek scripting room is possible outside the room. So this is a quote from Steve Benner. But there's a, if any, how many of you are Star Trekkers? I have a little, there's a little video that I, if someone, it's about two minutes, but it has sound. It's, there's a wonderful episode where uh, one of these, uh, individuals approaches one of the scientists in Star Trek and says, I have an interesting question I want to ask. What is life? And so she tries to define life in all the different ways and he say, no, but this can do that and this can do that. And then at the very end he says, what about me? You know, and he's a, obviously this man-made thing that can think. So it's, it's an inter interesting and it's actually this dude here. So we exclude other kinds of life because we do not believe that it could have arisen naturally. And this, I think, uh, occurred naturally is pretty interesting because at what point can we make something, an artificial life form, that is actually going to be as good as humans and do everything that humans do, or perhaps even be better? I mean, are we capable of doing that over a thousand year time scales? And how do we put that, how do we merge that into our thinking about, about life overall? And, you know, we have these very pessimistic ideas about what's going to happen to Earth in a billion years. But how can we actually salvage what is the essence of us as Homo sapiens, our intelligence, our ability to philosophize, explore? Maybe we can take that ability and place it into something that can actually survive conditions that would not allow carbon-based life to survive. So in the future, we will no longer be Homo sapiens, will be something that can be constructed by Homo sapiens that allows us to do what we do under conditions that are not great for us to live. So that's a lot of what at least our students in astrobiology at the University of Washington love to think about, you know, are these. And, and we, we have courses where they seem to be really concerned because they're in their 20s, even about a billion years from now. About how can we save Earth? And will we have the tech, technology and, you know, at that time to actually move Earth further away from the sun and have a different orbit? And, and so that's one of the ideas that we've actually had quite a bit of discussion on. So. It's kind of fun. So back to the question, do we need to define life in order to detect it? And uh, so even Cleland and, and Chiba seem to understand that there are characteristics of life that allow us to search for it. Uh, and 
that could leave biosignatures. And so carbon-based self-replicating uses chemical and light energy, undergoes Darwinian evolution, requires water and more than 20 elements, is what Earth life does. And so in the process of growing, making energy, doing metabolism, it produces biosignatures, and we'll talk about that later on. But all studies of the origin of life rely on these characteristics as basic starting points. Uh, and which of these canonical characteristics of Earth life has the greatest likelihood of being different in extraterrestrial carbon-based life? Uh, so I don't know. But I have a bias for carbon-based life because I think it, it's ubiquity in the universe and the many, many ways in which you can make organic compounds. Uh, we still are very Earth-centric. And I, I'm showing this. This is a picture of Ken Nielsen, a co colleague of mine, he nurses Southern California, California, formerly from Jet Propulsion Lab, who's also an astrobiologist. And he really th thinks that life can be recognized by what it does. Living organisms create hallmark molecules and create chemical dis disequilibrium. So no matter what it is or how we define it, it's going to leave a sign that it existed. So today in our search for life, we follow the water or follow the energy. Those are the two big concepts that we have. Uh, so something with water and then whether or not it has the same kind of energy sources that we find on, on Earth. Chemical energy, light energy are the two energy sources used by life today. And then we look for biosignatures and there's a variety of them, uh, including organic compounds that follow the rules of organic chemistry found in organisms, including chirality. Uh, the ratio of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur that Jonathan talked about. Uh, we have what are known as red field ratios, where in life the ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen, et cetera, follow very specific ratios. And so you can actually measure that uh, and chemical disequilibrium. Also, microbes, when they use a carbon compound, a sulfur compound, or a nitrogen compound that are present in different isotopes, uh, levels like C12 and C13, they fractionate in a, in depending on the kind of metabolism that goes on. So they leave a fractionation signal. Or you can look for intact cells. The Earth-centric approach to life elsewhere, as I said, is often expressed in the popular media. I, I thought I would show you a couple. One of my favorites uh, came out in the uh, 1920s in the New York Tribune uh, where they it's a wonderful picture of, of what they think Martians would have looked like back then. And this is based on what they thought they knew about Mars. That they differ from us in many ways. They have believed to have large noses uh, and ears and immense lung development, etc. And they're poorly developed because of gravity. But they, they clearly have telescopes and beautiful birds. And, and there's, there's a variety of these. And then just a, a few years ago, uh, as a result of some of the work that was done at the University of Arizona that, that was decided that uh, uh, Noah's Ark was really on Mars. And so one time it had water. And this was just a few years ago. You know, this is, this is a, a popular item. So anyway, it's, it's interesting when one goes and talks to the public about these kind of topics, how this is what they can actually get there. I have an aunt who actually just religiously believes in this kind of thing. And I mean religiously in its literal term. So, so what about the possibility of weird life that is different from Earth life? So how much time do I have? At least 15 minutes. Okay. Good. So what about the possibility of weird life that is different from Earth life? Could we detect it? And <clears throat> I'm not going to say too much about weird life other than I actually chaired a committee for the National Academy of Science called the Limits of Carbon-Based Life in the Universe, which is known as the Weird Life Report. And so we, we spent a lot of time looking at this issue. If you're interested, you can download that particular report uh, on, uh, if, you, if you Google uh, the National Academy of Science. You can download the whole thing for nothing. Uh, if you're interested in what we came up with with weird life. 
Well, so what is weird life and why are we interested in the degrees of weirdness from slight modifications to something really seriously weird? <clears throat> and without <laughs> I mean, you, we, we all have our, I mean, what is seriously weird? <clears throat> I think, you know, in terms of earth life, what is seriously weird are, are many of the people that enter politics. But then that's just my bias, you know. Uh, I can't help it. So slightly weird are, are the same biochemistry but maybe different amino acids and nucleotides. This is interesting because one of my colleagues, Steve Benner, who I'll show a picture of later on, actually has substituted different nucleotides into DNA as a way to actually help cure various diseases and, and still maintain an active DNA. Or novel metabolisms and actually I don't know what that means anymore. At, when we started the Weird Life Report, there were, I think, three ways to fix carbon dioxide, three metabolic pathways for taking carbon dioxide, like photosynthesis is one, the Calvin-Benson cycle. We now have seven. So we've identified four new ones just in the past seven or eight years. So we don't even, they're pretty novel, but they're, they do involve uh, reducing carbon dioxide. Slightly more weird, same biochemistry but utilize novel energy sources other than lighter energy. Is that possible, you know, wave energy, radiation energy, UV, etc. Are there organisms that can actually use different uh, energy? And seriously, there are more weird, very different biochemistry non-protein catalysis, for example, where all the catalysis takes place as a result of minerals. And I'll talk a little bit about that because that's a realistic model for the origin of life, early life, before proteins. Uh, Carbon-based but function in non-aqueous solvents. This is, this is what Jonathan Lenin would love to find, is something that could grow in organic solvents. That would be and I, I could make an interesting point. It, it is a paper that came out in the preceding National Academy of Sciences a, a couple of years ago that looked at the source of water inside a bacterial cell called E. coli. And what is interesting is that 70% of the water inside of E. coli is a result of metabolism, not from water brought in from without. So what is the possibility that the metabolic processes that actually make water that internally you can have water, but externally you, you couldn't have water, and that you might actually just have a water-generating system. So that, that's something that I think, you know, as astrobiologists, we really need to explore more of. And then seriously weird, non-cellular life, the kinds of things that uh, Shapiro and Frank Feinberg uh, mentioned. So again, would we be able to recognize something that was radically different? Uh, and so there's a couple of things. There's a couple of uh, programs going on. Uh, the digital or organism program uh, at Caltech, uh, the Avita program, that uh, is getting essentially mutation evolution going on uh, in, a, uh, in a digital organism and showing that Darwinian evolution actually does occur digitally. And if you want, you can, you can uh, go into that particular web page. It's very interesting. Another approach, how many of you heard of Craig Venter? The god of molecular biology in the Venter Institute. He calls himself that. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> being derogatory. Uh, he wants to synthesize life. That's his goal. And so in 2010, uh, he made his first uh, he had his first paper in Nature de trying to deal with this, where he actually, it's nothing particularly novel in one sense, because he, what he took is known genes and put them back together to make an organism. And, and this, is, this is basically the, the paper. So he was able to synthesize a whole chromosome, whole genome from scratch. So he assembled it, modified it, and put it into a, a cell that didn't have any DNA but had all the machinery for replicating DNA and making proteins. So that was another clever thing as he took everything out of, this, out of a cell and then put this new chromosome in and said, replicate me and make proteins from me and it worked. So 
when Nature published this, it decided to go talk to a bunch of scientists about what the implications are. And I've just gone to take a look at a couple of them. This is Steve Benner I've mentioned to you, who's one of the most prominent scientists in the origin of life work, and really a very, very smart person, and one that I really love to interact with. So he says the Venter work may actually help link chemistry to natural history, but I think the key point here is a new synthetic technology allows resurrection of such ancient bacteria whose behavior should inform us about planetary and ecological environments you know, millions of years ago. So that's his take on it. Again, we might be able to uh, recreate uh, life forms that, that are very ancient. Uh, Dave Deemer, uh, another uh, origin of life uh, researcher, Actually, he, he and Jack Shostak had just had a book that was published in, in 2010 by Cambridge University Press entitled The Origin of Life. I, I would really highly recommend if you're interested in this topic to get it. Jack Shostak, for those of you who don't know, won the Nobel Prize last year for his discovery of telomeres, which is part of higher organisms. But he's, uh, Jack Shostak is, we'll hear more about him when I talk about The Origin of Life. But uh, Shostak and Deemer have edited a book. Anyway, uh, what Deemer's take is that using the tools of synthetic biology, uh, perhaps DNA and proteins can be discarded. RNA itself can act as both a genetic molecule and as a catalyst. So if the synthetic RNA can be designed to catalyze its own reproduction without an artificial membrane, we really will have created life in the laboratory, perhaps resembling the first forms of life. So this, again, taking this very molecular methods, we might actually be able to do what we have not been able to do with uh, RNA so far, which is to design one that can self-replicate and can actually perhaps evolve to where it can evolve to have a genetic code, et cetera. Uh, and so the Steve Venter work then has stimulated a lot of, of discussion on what we can actually do in the laboratory using molecular techniques. Now, if you read all the comments in Nature, you'll find that several of them, or a couple of them, were actually also frightened by this technology and the ability to, for a bioterrorist to produce the world's worst possible organism, you know, that uh, we would have no resistance to. So that's the negative side to this technology. There's also a positive side to this technology in, in producing organisms that can make us new fuels, for example, and uh, do a bunch of new things. There's a group of organisms now that have been modified to where they make electricity. Uh, so we now have electricity producing bacteria, for example. And uh, the Toyota has bought that patent and hopes in the next 10 or 20 years to produce a, a bacterial battery that can run cars. So this is what I think molecular technology has done on the positive side, but who knows what can happen on the negative side. So the possible implications as sort of a summary, as a method to investigate the actual limits of carbon-based life uh, has come out of Venter's work. A growth at higher or lower temperatures, growth without water, organic solvents. Uh, also, can we construct the minimal cell, the kind of RNA cell? That, uh, or RNA life, and it's a whole range of hypotheses testing about early life and, and the origin of life that we can do from this kind of top-down molecular approach. So it's a very exciting time if you're a biologist right now. At the same time, there's some ton of ethical issues that we have to deal with. Uh, so back to the requirements for carbon-based life. Why it is so important that we understand the origin of life. Uh, <clears throat> if we're looking for life on any other planetary body, it has two ways to, to get there. One, a de novo origin. That is, it actually has its origin on that planetary body. The other is panspermia. It's transmitted from elsewhere. My concern, for example, in the search for life on Europa is that does it have any characteristics that would allow it to actually have a de novo origin? And since it's not likely to have had life transported from, let's say, Earth or Mars or even Venus, if Venus were active, it would actually have to have a de novo origin. Or perhaps Ganymede or Callisto had a, had a life at some point. But 
there's so much we don't understand about Europa. We may actually have an, o I mean, it has an ocean. It may actually support life that we know of on Earth, but it may not have life unless it's had a source. My, my point here is that we need to understand the origin of life when we explore for life elsewhere. It has to have a certain set of conditions to actually make life. And what I'll do in later lectures is try to make the point of what those conditions would have to be. What Europa would actually have to have to have a de novo origin of life. Some of you may have some opinions on that already. I'll be interested. And so maintaining life as we know it, liquid water, energy sources, and chemistry. Now I like to point out that We've already talked about carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, but also iron needs to be on there. But life, and life uses two energy forms. Hydrogen was probably the first energy source used by the earliest microbial ecosystems, and there's a lot of evidence for this. And I always like this Nesbitt and Sleep paper that uh, in Nature, where if you read the paper, the discussion is how nitrogen was really very, very prevalent and that the earliest organisms uh, were high temperature uh, hydrogen utilizers and formed a, a, something called a biofilm, which I'm going to talk about later on. Uh, so this is a, in, in a way a very prophetic paper. If you also read it, you can follow uh, the different groups of archaea and the different groups of bacteria over time based on the paleo evidence of that time. But it's a very, very uh, interesting paper. And actually, anything that either one of these people write, I have to read. You know? So anything that Norm Sleep writes, I read right away, and even though he's, uh, he's not a biologist. So life also requires oxidants. Uh, CO2, sulfur, iron are the most important, let's say, in dark ecosystems, that is, prior to photosynthesis. Oxygen is important in the last two billion years. So the first couple of billion years, the oxidants were really CO2, sulfur, iron uh, dominated uh, as what we call the, the electron acceptors that run these reactions. So essentially, metabolism for the first half of Earth history, really well, oxygen was not super significant. So life builds catalytic and energy transfer organic macromolecules around metals uh, and metal sulfur clusters. And this is going to be important later on because what we think is, is now that these metals and metal sulfur clusters and metal other minerals were, were the site of all the early catalytic reactions that are now done by proteins. Uh, and I'm going to talk a lot about that. Nitrogenase is one of my favorite enzymes because I work with it. It's the enzyme involved in fixing N2 from the atmosphere and reducing it to ammonia. It's extremely ancient. Uh, it, it's, in fact, it's so ancient that the iron sulfur part of this protein through a method called gene duplication led to the first iron sulfur photosynthetic protein. And we have very strong evidence of that. We also have strong evidence that nitrogenase, this enzyme, uh, existed before the separation of the three domains of life. So it's extremely ancient. Uh, if you're interested in this, there's a guy at Washington University of St. Louis, a Bob Blankenship, who's really just studies the evolution of this. And life requires trace elements. One of the things, it's not just CHONPS, and I've mentioned these iron sulfur clusters, but if we look at the periodic table and we look at what life requires, we can see the major elements in yellow, and then the minor cations, all life, and the major anions, all life, and then essential trace elements, all life. But what's important are these major biological transition metals, which are up here. Manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, molybdenum, tungsten. They're the ones that interact with proteins and uh, make them fairly active. And essentially, life as a protein-based life is going to require these elements in order to carry out the catalytic reaction. So it's not just carbon, hydrogen, etc. It's these other elements. And we have to have some kind of planetary body in our search for life that actually has those other elements in it. And putting this up, 
because these are the six main classes of enzymes as we know it. You don't have to really follow them, but the oxyoreductases, for example, are very much involved in basic metabolism. And so if you look at the metabolism involving hydrogen, uh, oxyoreductases are very important. Note that looking at the different kinds of enzymes, virtually every one of them have some kind of metal component to them. Uh, and only in ligases, which is a, a fairly more advanced protein that came later, uh, only has one. But the majority of, of a lot of these enzymes have these metal sulfur clusters. And we'll get back to that because what this is and what this tells us is that we want to go back and look at each of those metals as they exist as minerals in the environment and what can they do? What kind of catalysis can they do? And it's remarkable what they can do. <laughs> and so I, I, and when we talk about the origin of life, I'll get into that. So metal cluster proteins are remnants of both prebiotic and early life use of minerals to catalyze chemical reactions. Uh, so this is what they are, and we have very strong proof of that. So also life has a common ancestor. We mentioned that, and I mentioned the unity of biochemistry. That is, all extant organisms share the same biochemical and molecular characteristics. Same nucleotide bases, same 20 plus amino acids, same genetic code, same membrane lipids with straight chains of methyl branched, uh, same metabolic energetics that use either phosphate or thioesters. Everything, all life does all of this. And this is the concept of, of some, this common ancestor, which is going to be very important because what I want to do later on is focus in on that. What does this look like? What did we think about this last common ancestral pool of gene? What kind of environment would it have been in? And why did we end up with this unity of biochemistry? What was necessary to do that? And so I'm going to do some hand waving there. Uh, so the unity of biochemistry is reflected in the evolutionary relationship between all life, referred to as the global phylogenetic tree. I still have a couple of minutes. I can end at any time and do this later. Hmm? Are you guys okay with another five minutes or so? Uh, okay, I'm just showing this. If those of you who are not familiar with how a tree like this is made, uh, that you extract DNA from a cell and you look at one particular gene which is in involved in the ribosome, which is the, essentially the, uh, the structure that, that builds protein, and they're highly conserved among all living things. And so you can take a gene that is highly conserved and sequence it. And the sequence, because they share lots of common themes. So that, say the RNA that we look at has 1,505 bases. And of that 1,505 bases, quite a number of them are highly conserved along everything from humans to tomatoes to fungi to bacteria all have highly conserved regions. That allows that to be compared. And when we compare them, all life breaks down into three main groups, bacteria, archaea, and higher organisms, or eukara. And it also tells us that we can actually root the tree and say something about what the earliest forms of life were. And it also says something about this group of archaea, which may have actually led to the eukaryotes. And when we talk about the origin of eukaryotes, I'll talk more about this. The father of this tree is Carl Woese at the University of Illinois, uh, who just revolutionized the field of microbiology uh, more than probably anybody that I, I know. And this is his original tree published in, in 1990 uh, on this. And this is a, a complicated slide, but I want to point out that what was found once Carl Woese found that the archaea were not bacteria and they, they separated, we started looking at differential characteristics. Uh, and some of the keys on this are the kinds of membrane lipids uh, that all organisms have. And so say bacteria and us have the same kind of what we call ester link. If you're not familiar with this, this is an ester link, which is a C double bond O C. And the way lipids are found, these are long chain hydrocarbons that link up to a three carbon glycerol basically and form an ester bond. 
In the archaea, all of these bonds are formed by an ether link, which is a carbon-oxygen carbon, so it's not the double bond O. This is a very, very strong link. And so it allows these organisms, for example, to grow at pH zero, some to grow at pH at temperatures 122, et cetera. So I'll we'll talk about those later. So, and the other thing is, is that bacteria, all bacteria have the same component in their cell wall, which is called a peptidoglycan, which is a, as you can see, a protein and a sugar. Uh, and the archaea don't have those. They have at least seven different kinds of cell surface layers. A couple of other things is that the ribosome structure itself in the archaea, it's actually more like uh, the eukaryotes. And we'll get back to this theme because in understanding the origin of eukaryotes, we have to go back to the archaea. And I'll show you this you know, later on. So, and then I think I just have two slides, but other characteristics of bacteria and archaea which are gonna to come to play as we discuss this is that all organisms that make methane are archaea. Uh, and so this is interesting if you think that the methane on Mars, for example, is from living organism. There are no photosynthetic archaea, although, uh, yeah, I don't know about this anymore. As a, paper that came out a year ago or two years ago on this on a rhodopsin type pigment that was found in bacteria that was also found in a, in a marine archaea and I don't know what that does. All oxygenic or all photosynthetic bacteria that, that make uh, oxygen belong to one group, the cyanobacteria. Uh, there's also a very high diversity of anoxygenic photosynthetic bacteria and possibly go back to way below, even older than 3.5 billion years. Uh, nitrogen fixation occurs only in bacteria and archaea, not in higher organisms. And as I say, the bacteria and archaea utilize several metabolic pathways for fixing CO2, whereas plants and uh, cyanobacteria only use one pathway. And that only bacteria and archaea can grow anaerobically, but that's different now too. A 2010 paper, the first metazoan, multicellular animal ever found that is, grows under totally its whole life cycle is, is without oxygen. And I'm going to show you some pictures of those uh, later on. So I'm going to, maybe I should just end it here and uh, I can, because I think we're running over time. And so the next time I'll complete this and then go into more of the limits of life so you can get some idea of the diversity of life that lives under extreme conditions and how their characteristics can tell us something about what the earliest life forms would have looked like. So.